Hey everyone, thanks for joining me in the dojo today. Today's episode is brought to you by our sponsor, the Fair for Uber Car Program. Now, if you're like me, I got tired of driving my car and uh, I wanted to try something new and different, so I checked out the Fair for Uber Car Program. I used to drive a 2013 Prius, then I used the Fair Program and I got a really clean and spacious Hyundai Elantra with a great stereo system for $195 per week plus taxes. That includes everything, your rideshare insurance, and unlimited miles. And since Fair partners with Uber, you can earn a very strong bonus for a relatively low number of trips and pay for the car. This program is available in California for now, but there are programs all across the country. So check the Fair website for prices in your market. Some drivers are even getting their first week for free. So check it out. Download the Fair app and get a car today. It's a great program. And be sure to use our code, which is RSG100. That's our code, RSG100, so we get credit for sending you there. All right, all right, let's start the show. Welcome to the Rideshare Dojo. If you're an Uber or Lyft driver or anyone in the gig economy, this is the place for you. With tips and techniques, interviews with passengers and industry leaders, entertainment, inspiration, motivation. Here, with over 23,000 rides, is your host, Jay Crater. Let's enter the dojo. Hey, everybody. Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, Instacart drivers, Postmates, Ease, Zoom drivers, DoorDash, Via, Amazon Prime, Amazon Prime Now, Uber Eats, Grubhub, all you drivers and passengers and all of us who are part of this big, beautiful gig economy, welcome. It is so great to have you here for today's exciting episode. My name is Jay Crater. Let's enter the dojo. All right. Dojo Nation. Today we've got a really special guest. I always try and bring you special guests. My special guest today is Mr. David Wayne. I did just today discovered your middle name, David. David Wayne Reynolds. David Reynolds is um, a man I met about five months ago. He and I both started uh, creating podcasts at the same time. And he created a really remarkable uh, podcast, which is called Lead, Learn, Change. And um, what I want to do first is just say, hi, David. Hey, Jay. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Good to talk with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Um, At at, uh, the the, the summary of of David's uh, podcast says, think about the greatest experiences you've ever had. What or who made them so memorable? What did you lead, learn, or change, and why did it matter? Significant moments in one's life and career don't have to be few and far between. So I really like, David, that, um, that kind of uh, idea, right? The idea that you can have significant moments and they don't have to be like every 10 years, right? That you can, you can craft your life in a way that you can have significant uh, moments more frequently. Um, and that, that's what I call transformation, which is I, I'm all about transformation, you know, this love of pushing myself to kind of an edge where, you know, the way I've been doing things doesn't work anymore and I need to learn something else, right? And, and it just keeps kind of snowballing like that. So anyway, so that's just awesome. Um, can, can you share with, the, with, with my audience of, uh, as you know, I reach out to, to drivers, uh, rideshare drivers, people who drive for Uber and Lyft, but we're all very entrepreneurial uh, based. We're always thinking about, you know, ways that we can make more money in less time and, and putting together a plan B. So I found your topic really compelling. Um, what was your background, David? How did you get into this 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 topic of learning and, and changing and, and leading? Well, if you'll talk to lots of educators, they'll tell you, oh, I just loved kids or something along those lines. To be honest with you, mine did not start out that way. As an educator, I enjoyed a couple of classes I had in high school and then decided to take that same content area. It used to be called industrial arts back in the day with woodworking and drafting before there was CAD and electricity and those sorts of things. And I decided I wanted to have access to that type of experience for a long time. And I knew if I majored in industrial arts education, that I would 
have that. Uh, and it was really after I started teaching that I ended up liking the kids. Mm -hmm. And actually, I quit after my first year. Uh, I did not like it at all. So I thought, anything's better than this, and I'll do something else. So I went to a cabinet shop and built cabinets with a guy who had a mom-and-pop cabinet shop. Actually, it was just him when he hired me. And I learned a lot in the next year, but after about six weeks there, I thought, wow, anything's better than this. Hmm. So hmm. so uh, it, it wasn't bad work per se. It was just wasn't the thing. So I went back to the classroom at another school the next year, and it was like a different place. I told somebody the other day it was almost like changing careers, just changing Schools. a different – yeah. yeah, changing mm -hmm. school. So, uh, it and then I ended up liking it, and quite a few shifts happened thereafter. But that's how I got into it. Was I enjoyed the content, the woodworking, the design, that sort of stuff, and then it led into actually enjoying teaching, which then morphed into some other stuff. Yeah. So what um, what grades do you, did you teach? When I started out, I had some freshmen and some eighth graders. I'll tell you something really interesting. Um, you know, I do a lot of work with men. And uh, during this three-day event I, I created, it was called The Bridge, we did this real this process where <clears throat> the men would write down three things in life that caused them the most shame, so things that were done to them that caused shame, and then they were to write down three things that they did to other people, you know, that caused them shame. And, you know, then there was this whole other part of the process, but that was the beginning of it. And when when the men would share... Virtually every single guy had an incident that occurred in the sixth grade. I mean, it, it was like either they were bullied or some girl said something that, you know, crushed their soul or uh, or they were the bully and they, you know, regretted breaking someone's camera, whatever it was. Uh, it's a really difficult age to, uh, to, to, to be a human being, sixth grade. <laughs> Do you find that there's a lot of, a lot of drama around that age? Uh, there can be, and it is difficult. I think uh, that you know you're really struggling with trying to grow up and still kind of enjoying being a kid. I mean, I can remember back to my childhood, uh, sort of. I don't know what age it was, but I remember being at the mall in Louisville with my parents and my brothers, and going past the the merry-go-round and thinking, "Man, I'd really like to do that," but. That would be baby. I don't want to do that. You know, right. so I think that you're struggling and you get the peer pressure thing kicks in way beyond, you know, your brothers and the, and the guys on the street in the neighborhood. Right. So it, it can be I think it can be difficult. But to tell you the truth, in the classroom, I didn't really see much of that. I, I right. think that the I think that the content and the way that they had so much freedom to do what they wanted to do because of the way that the class was structured. It was really interesting the way that was set up. They were into it and we didn't really have much opportunity to get into that. And, yeah. and the way the class schedule was in the school, I actually taught every single student in the entire school. Hmm. So uh, I would see every student in one year and the classes were pretty short and then they rotated through and you'd see another another group would come through and then the next year I would do the same thing so I did get to see students year after year so I had them as sixth mm. graders seventh graders eighth graders but I never had them more than six weeks at a time when I was teaching freshmen I had them for a whole school year which right. was quite quite different hmm. interesting so what inspired you to create a podcast called uh, lead learn change well those three dimensions of life, I think, are inextricably linked, and I think that you can say one causes the other. You can have lots of philosophical arguments about about that. You know, does as the opener in the intro of the podcast says, does leading, uh, you know, cause learning, or does change cause learning, or does learning cause change? I mean, you can argue either way. It's almost a chicken egg thing. But to me, anything that ever happens of significance, individually or in a group, happens because Someone has stepped up and chosen to emerge as a leader. Doesn't have to be official position or title or role. And you're never going to make anything happen for yourself or for anybody else's benefit if you are not learning and if they're not learning as it happens. And by default, change is a result of learning. If you now know something that you didn't know before, 
or you now can do something that you couldn't do before, even if you don't act on it, your mind and your perspective has changed. And to me, I want to highlight people whose experiences and their thinking and their stories uncover the impact that those three things have made in, in their own lives and in the lives of others. I really want to shift a listener's perspective and create a meaningful call to action. And, and the guests have done an outstanding job prompting people to really reflect and think on what can I do to make a difference. And that's really what the, the impact project where I work is all about. It's, you know, what's changed as a result of our work? You know, right. are we making are we making a difference or not? Yeah. And I think I think a point that gets missed is that it doesn't have to be like leading a big group of people, but really just leading within your own life is is where most people uh, are going to experience what you're talking about here. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because I talk about transformation and um, and kind of this technology that I've laid out is, you know, making a commitment, you know, making a commitment like in our accountability group, making a commitment to 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 a group of people that will hold you accountable then you got to take the action and 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 then you take the action and, and it, what you just said is perfect here so then you take the action and you find out well it's not quite exactly like you thought that's where the learn comes in and then you and then you change to adapt to what you learned and then and then you do it again and it's just like this repeating cycle but what do you think stops people from leading and, and from the leading, then then learning and changing. What what's what do you think stops people from from living a life which can have these significant moments, you know, almost ongoingly throughout their life? I think for most people, the reason they hesitate to do something is uh, fear would probably be the the shortest word to describe that. But sometimes I think it's just uncertainty, and they jump to the worst case scenario in their mind about mm -hmm. what would happen if. Yeah. And it it really I guess that is a form of a form of fear. You're afraid of what other people might think. And I think sometimes you're afraid of what might happen if it actually works. Mm -hmm. Like on these podcasts, I mean You've got 10,000 plus downloads in an excessively, sh extremely short period of time. That's, that's quite phenomenal. And the reason that that has happened is because you are generating a lot of material. You are a, you are creating content and you're putting it out there and you're shipping every day and you're not hiding behind, oh, this is not perfect uh, it's good enough, and I don't mean that in a in a negative mm -hmm. way to say, oh, that's you know your stuff's adequate, Jay. I'm mm -hmm. saying that, you know, you're you're shipping your work and you're doing it. And I think uh, there was an evangelist, Dwight L. Moody, who was criticized because of his evangelistic methods, and his response was, "I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it." Right. So, so I mean, <laughs> I think that's just a, a classic response. Like I'm, I'm doing something. I actually have. A, wait, wait. Just say that again. I just, if you're out there listening to this in your car, this is priceless. Okay, just tell so, that a little bit again. <laughs> yeah, Dwight Moody was an evangelist. He's the the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. I think I don't know what his years of of ministry were, but it seems like it was in the early 1900s or mid 1900s, and he was criticized for his evangelistic methods because they were out of the norm. And his response to the criticism was, I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. And, you know, <laughs> that's so good. <laughs> well, Seth, Seth wrote a blog post. Seth Godin wrote a blog post about that. It's been on my desk uh, for about two years. And the title was, You're Doing It Wrong. And the text is, But at least you're doing it. Once you're doing it, you have a chance to do it better. You know, waiting for perfect means not starting. And I think that people can hide behind that because I think people worry too much about what other people think. You, do you need to have standards? Sure. Do you need to maintain the uh, a professional tone if you're a professional? And do you need to be a good representative for your organization or at least reflect it in the way that it's intended to be reflected? Absolutely. You know, you don't need to be a hypocrite. You don't need to. No. Tell your kids that it's uh, it's not okay to 
to lie, cheat, and steal, and then you fudge on your income taxes. I, I mean, that's that's not correct. But you can't hide behind, you know, the fact that you might mess up and you may appear hypocritical sometimes, or you might not get it right the first time. I mean, nobody really gets it right the first time. One of the things that Scott Perry said to me when I interviewed him for um, episode five, I think, he said, you did a lot of bad walking before you became a good walker. You did a lot of bad talking before you were a good talker and a lot of bad writing before you became a good writer. And that's just life. So this change thing of lead, learn, change is it's going to happen. And one of the things I say is you can talk about change. You can anticipate it. You can dread it. You can just be swept along by it. Or you can actually try to influence it and make that change happen in a way that's going to benefit other people. Yeah. So so if you're out there driving in your car now and you've been thinking about starting something, you've been thinking about, I don't know, telling a woman you love her. You've been thinking about, uh, I don't know, maybe this is a part-time gig and you need to go ask your boss for a raise. Maybe you've got a new project that you want to suggest that you could do with your business. Maybe you want to start a new company. Whatever it is, it's... it's um, what we're talking about is that there's like almost like two types of people. There's people that think about things, you know, and then and then they're dead. And then there are people who just say going to do it and and be damned the results, you know, it, by by stepping up and doing it, you're going to learn and in that learning, you're going to you're going to figure out what's the next step and at least then you're in the game doing something rather than being this fearful person just waiting for whatever, which never comes, right? Tomorrow never comes, and and you're still, you know, in, in, you're you're just sort of stuck. David Thoreau said, famously, most men lead lives of quiet desperation. So I I think your podcast is great because I got to think this topic of 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 walking into the fear um, is a is such a valuable uh, thing for people to hear. That it's okay. It's okay to be afraid and take action. In fact, nine times out of ten, you are going to be afraid when you're taking taking big action. That's a normal response. And instead of instead of at least in in my case, it just feels so frustrating to just step back and and go back to my comfort zone. It, but when once I take that step, even though I'm afraid, it's like this. I don't know what it is. It's like a I don't know. It's like balloons going off. It's like it's like my heart opens up. It's like I feel this burst of energy and enthusiasm for the future uh, when I when I feel that fear and I still take that action. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that uh, if you you might not hear these fantastic stories, although I think there's a couple of them that really are quite uh, significant and amazing. If you listen to the podcast, for example, mine, not yours. But when you think about the guests and what they've done in their lives, they really are doing exactly what we're talking about. I mean, the the first the teacher in the first episode heard someone speak and had her perspective shifted and decided to change the way she approached her interaction with her students. And somebody else decided to leave their job as a chemist, mm. uh, even ha even having written a couple of patents. And uh, they there was a downsizing and there was a layoff. But instead of going back to that profession uh, during the interim employment, decided that there was a different thing for them and ended up going into into teaching. And that was an uncertain Thing. Yeah. Well, and, so so you've talked to quite a few people. What what would you say has been the biggest insight um, or lesson that you've gleaned from from you know all your from your all your podcast interviews so far? That's a great question. I I would have to go with resilience of the human spirit and determination and the ability of people to demonstrate that when they're consistent with their core values over time that it does have more than a ripple effect and ends up really impacting a lot of people positively. I, you know, just do things that you, you know are right, that you really enjoy, that you know you should be doing and do them the best way possible and always think about the benefit to the other person 
if you're a, if you're an educator, then what's every decision that's made in the school ought to be for learner benefit. Period. Not adult convenience. Not because that's the way we've always done it. Not because of the uh, logistic uh, constraints that we have, and, and supposedly that won't let us do X, Y, or Z. But every decision needs to be run through the filter. How will this benefit? students and student learning yeah so whatever job you're in you need to say who is it i'm trying to serve and then every decision that you make needs to be how does this increase the likelihood that this is going to benefit that person and i think every guest has demonstrated that that's how they operate that's how they think that's their filter for what they do i do think that um a couple of key key tenets which you brought up or um, if, if you just sort of lay out like your life's purpose is being of service in whatever venue you're operating, things, things tend to work out much better for me, at least when, when I'm thinking about like if I'm talking to a prospect, you know, how can I be of service to this person? And that usually just bounces back in, in, onto my life, you know, as a very positive thing. And, and also being in a place of gratitude that, that we get to play in the game that we choose to play in, you know, a lot of, a lot sure. of people don't have that opportunity. A lot of people are dead, you know, we're alive and, and we have some ability to, to choose the direction we go and the things we do. So. And make it a choice about whether something is for someone else's benefit. Sometimes that decision can't be made oftentimes maybe without asking the other person, or talking to them. I remember one time I created this document, which I thought was brilliant. I'm being a little facetious there, sarcastic, but I thought this is amazing. I have pulled together these concepts that it, I've David, been exposed. D- David, to. It, it was brilliant. I read it, and it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, you haven't seen this one, Jay, but I appreciate it. So I did have the good sense to send it to a colleague of mine, from whom some of the concepts had been generated initially, and I said, hey. George, what do you what do you think about this? And I thought I had just pulled together decades of content in on one piece of paper. And of course, you know, I, I struggle with brevity on writing. So for me, that was quite a feat. And so I got the answer back from George and he said, well, David, I think it's great if you're the customer. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that stuck with me thinking, yeah. I thought it was good, but who is it really for? It goes back to the who's it for, what's it for thing. The first guest that uh, in the podcast that I mentioned just a second ago, I remember her sharing with a group of new teachers to the district, not necessarily first-year teachers, but new to our school district. And she was talking about a unit that she had developed that she just thought was incredible. It was third grade. It was about newspapers and I won't go into those details, but she just loved it. And she talked to her students after the fact and realized that virtually no one in the room enjoyed it at all. Hmm. They did it. They were compliant, but they were never engaged. They did it because she asked them to. They were good students. They wanted the grade, all those types of reasons. None of those things are bad, but it falls short of being engage, engaged where you really voluntarily commit your attention and invest your time because you value the work, not because you're going to get some other uh, reward out of it. And so the only way that she was able to uh, shift that lesson or the only reason she did was because she talked with the people that intersected with the work. And if if she had not, you can call them customers or, or the most important people you serve or whatever you want. If she hadn't talked with them, she would have gone on to the next school year, the next group of third graders, and thought, this was great. They yeah. loved it, and yeah. I'm going to do this again. And that's how those horrible laminated lesson plans get in place, and then there's no learning taking place. So well, she was very wise to do that. Yeah, this, it's, uh, this whole topic of feedback, <clears throat> which, of course, we cover quite a bit in uh, Seth Godin's work um, and, and uh, in our little you know, 60 seconds, of the, the uh, discourse channel that we share – it's so valuable. It's so important to, if you put work out there, to allow other people to respond, to not be defensive of it, to be open to it, and in fact, to appreciate how rare it is that somebody 
takes a look at your work and then is you know willing to share themselves and tell you what they think. Oh, that's so true. I got to tell you a story you made me think of. So right now at work, we're engaged in a, another phase of our research and we're back to interacting with individual educators one-on-one. We've done some school-wide studies and some networks of multiple contiguous high poverty districts. And now we're swinging the pendulum back to the individual educator. And we view teachers as leaders, as you made reference to earlier. And so one of the things, the main thing that happens in this new iteration of research is I simply go to a classroom where someone has said, sure, please come in. They're all volunteers. And I'm just there for the duration of the lesson or however long he or she wants me to be there, a minimum of about 45 minutes. And I don't really take any notes, which is difficult to do. But as soon as I leave, I write down what I saw, heard, learned, and what I want to learn more about. And then I go back and see the teacher at the first opportunity, whenever it's convenient for them. And we sit down and we talk about what happened that day. It's it's that simple. It's non-evaluative. I'm not in some uh, uh, accrediting organization. And uh, and the thing that seems to resonate the most is, here's what I learned. As somebody who came to your classroom as an adult who's been in education for almost 40 years, I learned this, and now here's some things I want to learn more about. And I sat with a teacher who had been teaching for 18 years, and she said to me, I was very surprised because, you know, teachers are, quote unquote, evaluated and observations are conducted on a relatively frequent basis and feedback is provided. But she said to me, this is the most feedback I have ever received in 18 years. And what you just said about being appreciative of it Mm -hmm. was was so true. It was a different kind of feedback. What we were doing was we were talking about her work and the students learning. We were not looking at uh, behaviors or activities on a checklist or how much time was spent doing X, Y, or Z. It was how come this was designed this way? How might you do it differently if there were different learners in the room? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, there's others, but it's just a conversation and people do appreciate that feedback and you can't get it if you don't talk with people. And so right. that's just a huge, huge piece of, of learning and uh, by doing that, I think you're leading people to do, engage in their own learning and then shifts in work happen and shifts in attitude and then change happens. Just that word engage, you know, I think so many people are not engaged in their own life. They're doing it their way and and uh, such a shift happens when you engage and suddenly you're part of a community. And like you said, if you're in a community where you can be held accountable and get feedback. That's that's even even more more special and rare. So, what what's been the greatest experience in your life so far? So, we're talking about these these great moments, these moments of of leading, learning, and changing. Looking back over your life, uh, what's been the greatest experience you've had so far? Do you have one that stands out? I have to immediately go to something about interaction with people. I think that it is, it is the, the who that matters most. It's relationships that matter more than other stuff. And so my the very first thing that comes to mind is a, a dual a response, which is meeting and marrying my wife and our, our son at being added to our family when he was born. I, I don't, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can't think of anything else on the, you know, in the earthly realm that could could compare with that. It's been a, it's an ongoing learning process. There's no handbook uh, as a parent, for example, or as a spouse, there's books out there, but hey, you know, those aren't written by me and they weren't married to her and that's yeah. not our kid. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's, there's truths and there's principles, uh, especially, you know, if they're, if they're, depending on what your core beliefs are, if they're faith-based or not, but there's principles that you try to adhere to, but it's kind of a, a learn as you go experience. Oh, and for sure. I think right yeah. now, like to be honest, if you said, you know, what's one of the greatest things you've ever read? I think uh, a, a text message that I got from Jackson yesterday. I've talked a little bit and I know that, you know, your daughter's heading to medical school and, and our son is in it. Mm-hmm. And uh, despite the unbelievable deluge of expectations and the uh, flood 
of work that is constantly mm. in front of you and the time constraints, he takes time to to text or call every now and then. We actually got to see him face to face last week, he and his new wife, which was great. But when you get a text message where you are uh, getting inside somebody's head and heart and they mm. say, man, I appreciate so much. Uh, you know, what you all did as parents or having you as a dad. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I'm answering your question about what's one of the greatest things. That kind of stuff, yeah. you know, getting to have a cup of coffee with Debbie uh, when I want to and uh, having her here to support me for 38 years now. And, you know, we're looking forward to the next 38. It's just, to me, the, that's the most incredible experience. You know, yeah, I bungee mm-hmm. jumped off of a tower and, and I parasailed and done some of that kind of stuff. And I've, I've been, you know, to Dubai, but that's, that's just a thing. And those things are not as important. So I, I have to go with uh, the relationships with people. And of course those two. The in family. Particular. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, last, last thing I, uh, for my audience, what, what's the number one thing, you know, based on what you've learned doing your podcast, um, what's the number one thing my audience can do to increase the the frequency of these kind of life, substantial life learning events? I believe that goes back to something shared earlier, which is focus on and spend time pursuing things that align with what you really believe and what you really love, that intersection of, of passion and purpose, and find out if there are some things that are wasting your time. It's just a true waste of your life. Is there stuff that you're doing that mm. really has no value? I don't Maybe that's, you know, for, it's different things for different people, so I'm not going to make a big list because <laughs> then the people who think those things are the greatest things since sliced bread will be, be irritated. But, you know, right. maybe maybe it's, you know, watching too much television or maybe it's, you know, uh, you know, just spending too much time, uh, putting off, as you mentioned earlier to mentioning Mm -hmm. to your, your audience, like if you're thinking about making a change or thinking about doing something, go ahead and pursue that, you know, study, learn, whatever. I, I just think it's prioritize around things that matter most. And that's probably going to be people first and then something to, to make your or their lives better, Second, if not at the same time, parallel with that, and try to jettison the junk and do some strategic abandonment of uh, processes and things that just kind of get used to, but they might not, they might have outlived their purpose. Maybe they're not bad things. Maybe they're just things that yeah. don't have a purpose anymore. Yeah. So what he's saying, uh, Dojo Nation, is there, there are things that are, that are important. And I, I like what you just said, David, things, things that, co- that you believe in and that you enjoy, that that's, those are qualities, be, qual- yeah. qualities of activity. Okay. Um, that when you put those two things together, um, you, you can really find something meaningful. Yeah. I, I, I like that. Things you believe in and things that you enjoy and, and it's sustainable too. Right. So instead of, so for me, I'll, I'll confess one of my weaknesses is that I really like to binge watch TV. And frankly, I don't binge watch anything unless I think it's really, really good. But at some point, you know, there's a lot of good stuff out there to to binge watch now. And I got other things to do. So uh, lately, I've had to make a conscious effort to say I'm only going to watch, you know, maybe half an hour of TV a day. So maybe three to four hours a week, where I used to watch 10 to 15 hours a week. And, And while it's totally enjoyable, that's not enough for me anymore. You know, it's got to be something that I believe in and that moves my, you know, my business life and my social life and my, you know, the, my relationships forward. Um, so I think that's great advice, really, to prioritize what's what's really important and what's really going to allow a, an individual to, you know, step into that 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 zone where where the magic happens. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. All right. Fantastic advice. This has been awesome. So I'm going to ask you the, the last three questions, which I ask all of my um, my guests. What, Mr. David Reynolds, is your favorite movie of all time? Well, I'm not a movie aficionado, but the one that 
I have watched multiple times, and I think that's an indicator that you like it if you watch it more than once, uh, is actually a musical, and it's the Fiddler on the Roof with uh, the actor Topol paying Kevya. I think it's just one of the best uh, roles ever played, and the, the story is riveting, and uh, you know it's historical fiction, so to speak, or fictionalized history, but it's just an outstanding uh, story. So I really... That's great. I really lean towards that one. All right. Fiddler on the Roof. Nice. Um, the penultimate question. What pictures do you have on the wallpaper on your phone? I have on a lock screen, mm -hmm. a Debbie and I. Uh -huh. On the home screen, the three of us, Debbie Jackson and I. And on the screen on the iPad... The four of us, which would be Debbie and Jackson and our new daughter-in-law, Elizabeth. So family on all of it. Nice. Very nice. I uh, recently updated mine. And, <laughs> and what I have now um, is a um, crab meat omelet that I, that I purchased and ate in Thailand. So <laughs> that's what makes the world well, go around. Yep. Yep. Uh, so when you, last question, <clears throat> when you walk into the room and they're saying, uh, now entering the room, Mr. David Reynolds, what is your theme song? What music are we listening to? What song? Wow. That's, that question has never been asked of me before. <laughs> so I know I just uh, thought of this question. I thought <laughs> this is such a great question because yeah, I, 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 I hear this great songs. Yeah, and I think you just told me you asked that to all your guests. I do, <laughs> so, I do, yes. So, um, wow. Well, I don't think it necessarily describes me, but the, one of the first songs that comes to mind is Just the Way You Look Tonight by Sinatra, because Debbie and I enjoy that. But Old Time Rock and Roll by Bob Seger, I believe I was present when he performed that live for the first time. At least he said so. Maybe he said that to every crowd on tour that year. What's and, what's uh, that called? Old time rock and roll. Old time rock and roll by Bob Seger. Oh, yeah. It's just a, it's a it's a good one. And then uh, yeah, there you go. Oh, see, yeah. Listen to Mr. David Reynolds rocking it. <laughs> so that that was just a favorite. I liked Bob Seger and. Junior high, high school. Oh uh, yeah, at a concert with uh, he was a friend the, of mine. He was the man. He was all over the radio when I was a teenager. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I would have to just pick one of those songs. I don't think that would be the the music that would introduce me necessarily, but that would be fine if either one of those were playing or or yeah. Put me in coach by John Fogerty. I like some old CCR stuff. So yeah, uh, yeah. All right, all right, fantastic. All right, last shot. You got anything else you want to share with uh, with Dojo Nation out there? Yeah, every time I get a platform like this, I like to tell people teachers matter. And take a second today to five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, find somebody who's taught you something, whether it was a teacher in school or a colleague or a family member or anybody, and tell them thanks. If you haven't done it, and if it, the further from the past, probably the more uh, – refreshing and meaningful it might be. But I think even if it's just somebody you saw last week who taught you something, people need to get that feedback we were talking about earlier and know that they're appreciated, that they made a difference. So teachers matter and teaching matters, learning matters and uh, tell somebody thanks. I, that's, I would, I'll say that every chance I get. Yeah. That's a really beautiful sentiment. Yeah. Good sentiment. Thank you so much, David. It was great talking to you. Thank you for entering uh, the dojo. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. If you're thinking about starting an online business, definitely check out my website at nomadj.com, where you can get my free ebook called What's Next? How to Do Online Work You Love From Anywhere in the World. That is nomadjay.com. I also do a daily one-minute-per-day podcast called Nomad Daily, in which I share different aspects of life. Uh, Nomad Daily with Jay Creator is available wherever you get your podcasts. People are really liking it. Check it out. You just uh, subscribe, and then every day you're just gonna it's gonna automatically load up, and you're gonna get the next episode. And you just listen for a minute to a minute and a half, and boom, you're done. 
And uh, it's great. I'm really enjoying doing that. All right. Next episode, more news, interviews, all things Rideshare Dojo for drivers and all of us in the gig economy. I will do my best to bring you the best here in the dojo. This is Jay Crater saying thanks for entering the dojo every Monday and Thursday. Drive happy and be safe out there. Loved this episode of the Rideshare Dojo podcast? Head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. It really helps and it's very much appreciated. Be sure to visit RideshareDojo.com to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. Thanks for listening and be safe out there.